Well, good morning again. Man, what an awesome time just to lift up the name of Jesus. Uh, We're in a series. It's kind of weird. Normally when we have Easter, we either begin a series or we end a series or we kind of make just a standalone message. But with this year, uh, we just kind of stuck the Easter sermon right in the middle of a sermon series that we're doing called Creed. And we're studying the Apostles' Creed, and we've said a few things about the Apostles' Creed that, uh, number one, it's, it's not an incantation, like it won't save us, there's nothing, no power in that, um, and, but it's not a replacement for the Bible. It's not something that we can use in place of the Bible. We're using uh, the creed to teach the Bible. And we've said that it's a tool to correct heresy. Like if there's something in our lives that, or someone else's lives that we can look at and uh, we can correct heresy. And then, and then we've also said this is used to aid against persecution. And so there are uh, no unimportant parts of our body, right? Like every part of our body is important, even like the ones that they tell us we can live without. They still serve a function, like the appendix, right? Like that's, it, it, it's, I don't know what function it serves, but they, if it's in there, it's got to serve some sort of function. But you can live without some, some parts of your body. Like if you cut your hand off, don't do it. But, but if, you, if, if you were to cut your hand off, like you can still live without it. If you cut your leg off, you can still live without it. Like there's even some like vital things like kidneys. You can actually live without kidneys, with dialysis. But here's the thing. You, there's some parts of your body you can't live without, right? Like your heart. Some of y'all might question whether or not you have a heart, but, but it's proven that you can't live without your heart. And your brain? I know some of y'all have tried to prove you can't live without a brain, but you still have one up there, right? Like, like you, but you can't live without a brain. So that's what we're, we're saying. These are the things of our Christian faith that we cannot live without. And so we've studied about God, and we've studied about Jesus, and then we talked about the virgin birth, and last week we talked about Jesus getting the suffering under Pontius Pilate, and this week we've come to, he descended to the dead, on the third day he arose. Now you see why we kind of planned it this way, right? Kind of fits in with what the day is and what we're celebrating. So if you have your Bibles uh, with you, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have your Bibles, that's perfectly fine. It'll be up on the screen uh, for you to follow along with. This is uh, Paul's writing to, this is his first letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. And so what he was writing to them, he was reminding them of something. He says this in verse 1. He says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Verse 2, by this gospel you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's what he passed on to them, what he was reminding them of, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. If you don't know who Cephas is, it's Peter. Okay, just going to clear that up for you so you understand. So he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. They're still alive. Not now, but when he was writing this. Just Though some have fallen asleep. So he's saying some have already passed away. Number, verse 7. Then he appeared to James, who was the brother of Jesus. Then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Have y'all ever heard like old wives' tales? You've heard some old white, like, like if, you, if you crack your knuckles, like that, right? What is it going to do to my fingers later on in life? What am I going to have? Arthritis, right? It's an old wives' tale. There's no proof. I've been cracking them for 41 years, and so I mean, like, like, like here's another one. If you swallow a piece of gum, how long is it going to stay in your stomach? Forever. Forever. Seven years is what I, like, I grew up, it's like, man, if you, Mickey, if you swallow that piece of gum, it's going to stay in that stomach for seven years. Like, that's, that's not true. Sorry. <laughs> it's just not true. Or, or how about this? I'm, parents, I'm sorry about this one. But how long do you have to wait after you, go, after you eat to go swimming? <laughs> right? Like, like it varies. So who's like the expert on this? Like some say you got to wait an hour. You got to wait 30 minutes. You, like I'm eating and I'm diving in with food in my hand. Like, I, like, I, it's, just, like it's not true. Like shaving. If you shave, what's it going to do to your hair? It's going to grow back what? Thicker, right? If that's the case, I'd shave my head because right up here it's growing thinner, okay? So, so like, like, that's just not true. Or how about chocolate? You eat chocolate, what's it going to do to your face? You're going to break out, right? Turns out, 
Not washing your face is what causes that. It's crazy, right? Here's another one. Here's, here's, a, here's an old wife's tale that essential oils actually work. I mean, like, uh, my mom's probably going to fight me on that one, but that's all right. I mean, she's... Uh, or, but like, like, here's what happens to old wives' tales. Like, like they, they grow and they grow and then become, they, they're like legends, right? They become like, 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 like urban legends. Like if you go to Florida, you go to St. Augustine, there's this place down there that Ponce de, Ponce de Leon, when he was rummaging around Florida trying to find things called the Fountain of Youth. I've been there. My hair's still falling out. Like it doesn't work. It, it's, it's an urban legend. Or how about Bigfoot? Sasquatch? Like seriously, I'm sorry. But isn't it funny, like, every time you, like, they have a picture of him, like, Sasquatch, he's in the same pose. <laughs> like, what is that? Like, like, come on. Or how about Bloody Mary? Not, not the drink. We're not, we're not going there this morning. But, like, you stand in front of a mirror, and you say whatever, and then, like, this Mary shows up. Like, urban legend. Or how about Elvis is alive? Urban legend. If Elvis was still alive, he'd be, like, in his 90s. There's no, like, he... Uh, he Look, he, he rode hard there for a couple years. I don't think he'd still be alive. <laughs> these are myths. There's no authenticity to, to these urban legends. Many of them have been proven not true. And to some, the story of Jesus rising from the dead fits in the same category as these. And some of you are probably like, what do you mean? Like, it's, it's I don't know anybody that thinks that they fit in. The, yeah, you do. They're just not going to tell you because they think, man, that, they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and I'm just going to let them, like, they, they can do them and I'll be over here and they just keep believing. They're just too far in. They can't, they can't turn back now. Like, like, they're just so far in it. And I... So here's what I want you to understand on this Easter Sunday, 2021. The collection of the New Testament writings, most of which were written by the Apostle Paul, have proven... <laughs> to be reliable, historical documents. And if you read the New Testament writings and you take a look at the story of Christ rising from the dead, there is nothing about the story at surface level that's written in the Bible that is a happily ever after story. There is nothing in that story that says this is fairy tale land. There's nothing in that story that says in a land far, far away. This is not the stuff that legends are made of. This is not fairy tale. Because we know, like fairy tales, all end really good, right? Like we're like, oh, we feel good about ourselves. Like we watch that Disney movie that come on Disney Plus now and like we can go back and watch all that and like we feel really good to watch them because it all ends really good. Most of this story doesn't end good. And so what I want you to see today is that this story is right in the middle of history. When Luke was writing his gospel, Luke, if you don't know who Luke was, Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, but he also wrote Acts. And so when Luke was writing his gospel, Luke was a very well-respected medical doctor. And so when he's writing this story, he has everything to lose. He has everything to lose. And really nothing to gain. He's got a great great job. He's got a great life. And he follows this guy around named Jesus. And he writes down what he sees. And he opens his letter up and says, In the time of King Herod of Judea, a real place, a real person proven. And so, so what I want you to see, the first thing I want you to see is that Bible is very specific. The the Bible is very specific. Because we all want details, right? Like we want want the the details of it, and and, and the Bible has them. Like we know exactly where Jesus rose from the dead. We know know where he was born, and we know where he rose from the dead. You can actually go there. It's not in a land far, far away. It's not like over there. It's not on the roof. There was such a clatter and all this stuff. You know, it is right. We know exactly where it is. And Luke goes on in, in, in chapter 3. And let me just show you how specific he is. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, a real ruler, the Roman government, 
It says, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, a real person, a real title, and a real place. And then it says, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis. These are terrible city names. <laughs> but they're real places. You can, you, if you have your Bible, you can go back in the maps and they'll show it to you. Better yet, just go to Google. It's in there too. It's probably a lot faster. And then Lysanias. Oh yeah, what about him, right? Well, he was the tetrarch, tetrarch of Abilene. Not Texas. And then, and then verse 2, it says, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Why is he so specific? Like when he's writing this, because he wants to tell us this, this is not just some made up fairy tale land. This isn't Camelot. This is, this is a real place, a real time in history. Because all he's trying to tell us is he's, trying to, he's, he's leading all that off to tell us about a dude who was out in the wilderness eating bugs who wore camel skin named John. Like we know him as John the Baptist. But this is like GPS, precise GPS location of exactly what time, where this was taking place. This is specific. A real place described specifically. There are 30 other historical documents and historical figures mentioned in, in Scripture that, are, that have been verified through non-biblical sources. Now, that, to me, that only points to the full authenticity of what the Bible tells us. That's very specific. The second thing I'll tell you is it's instant. This, was, this story of Jesus is right. It was instant. It was instant. Like, like, as soon as, like, within 50 days, the disciples were out in the streets preaching this. Within 50 days. How do we know anything about history? History class, right? Some of y'all listened, some of you didn't. So you might like, I know a little bit more and I know a little bit less. And um, I, when I first started college, I, wanted, I, I thought I wanted to be a math major. And then it, I decided out it, 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 it didn't come to me. It went to my son. And then now, uh, now like, um, uh, then I said, well, I want to be a history major. So I started taking all these history classes. And turns out it, it, it helped me in the long run. But then I said, well, let's just go something easy. Let's go PE, right? Uh, you know, because I'm an athlete and I can, I can do this. And, you know, I won't get into all that because I don't want to get anybody in trouble from 25 years ago. But anyway, but we know stuff about history from history class, right? So how do we know about George, who our first president was? George Washington. How do we know about him, right? Like, like that he... Chop down the cherry tree that he could never tell a lie. Like, that's urban legend, by the way. That's, that's not true. But what we know about all that stuff from history class. So, but that's only a couple hundred years. Let's go back even further. What about Alexander the Great? Same way, right? But how do we know about it in history? How did we find out about it in history class? Well, there's two biographies that were written about Alexander the Great. One by Arian and one by Plutarch. Okay? And, and what they write in this, they write about how he was tutored by Aristotle, and they write about how uh, by the age of 30, he conquered the entire world, and that he never lost a battle, and that, uh, like, I, I, which I, I mean, I find that hard to believe. Like, I mean, you tell me he didn't play like thumb war, and somebody like drop kicked him on, like, 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 like come on. But, but by the age of 31, he was so bummed out, and he just sat down and cried because he said, there's nothing left to conquer. And then he died at age 32. We, we know all this from the biographies that were written about his life. They were written 400 years after he died. Last time I checked, there's not any college classes that are questioning the legitimacy of Alexander the Great's reign. Like how many professors are standing up, do we really believe that Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle? Because the only documents we have were for, written 400 years. I don't know of any college classes that are doing that. But you know what they are doing? They're standing up and questioning the legitimacy of how instant it was for Jesus to rise from the dead. And it was within 50 days. Does that make sense? Like Paul, let's, let's just go back and let's just look at this right here, what we're talking about. Paul, who wrote this, this letter that we read just a second ago, this, these verses to the church in Corinth. Okay, we know... From historical documentation, we know that this letter was written in the year 55 AD. Jesus died around 30 AD. So that's 25 years 
that Paul actually took what he knew, wrote it down, and then sent it to the church in Corinth. 25 years, that's a long time, right? Certainly that's enough time to, to make up some stories, to fill in some blanks where it's kind of thing, and you know, do all this other stuff, and, and you know, say that, hey, Christ, Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose, you know, 25 years. Mickey, that's not that instant. You said it was instant. We'll go back to verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, and look what he was writing to him. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to what? Remind you. What does that tell you? He's already told them. Like it was before 25 years that he had told them about all this, that Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose again. He appeared to Cephas. He appeared to 500. He appeared to James. He's already, he's already told them this. He's already preached it to them. They already knew it. Most of the New Testament was written by the year 70 AD. All of the New Testament was completed by 100. John was the last one to, to, to pin his uh, revelation from the Isle of Patmos. And, and, and it was late in, it was year 98 was the year he completed that. So by 100, so 70, within 70 years of the time that Jesus died to the, to the time that the last book of the Bible in the New Testament was written. 70 years. That's a long time. But that's why Paul was saying, he goes, some of y'all are still alive. They can attest to it. To me, the fact that it was, all this was compiled within 70 years, all pointing to the same thing, the same person, the same time, <laughs> proof. Because you can't make it up that quick. You can't make it up that quick. And here's the thing about it. Paul wasn't just, he, he was saying, he goes, look, I just, I'm not telling you this, but I believe this. In verse 3, he said, For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. Paul believed what he was preaching. He believed in what he was telling them. Paul, he tells about his journey in Galatians 1, and he talks about that for, after, he, um, after he received Christ as a Savior, he, uh, he, he went on a three-year journey out in the wilderness. And he just learned and just, just learned and learned and learned and learned and learned. And then he came back to Jerusalem and, and he taught with Peter and then he taught with James. And they, they taught him what this creed was. This was their creed. This was that, that, you know, that, that Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. You know, I don't know if they put it to the tune of Adam's family to remember it, like days of the week or something like that. Or like, like, but, but this was how they remembered stuff. And it's believed, listen, it's believed that they implemented this in the church in Jerusalem under the leadership of James within six months after Christ's resurrection. That's pretty instant. That's pretty instant. So the, the story is specific, the story is instant, and the, sec, the next thing I'll tell you is that this story and the Bible is pretty awkward. It's pretty awkward. Have you ever thought about that? Like, like, there's some pretty awkward things in the Bible. Like, let's just take Peter, all right? Peter, who was the leader of the church, he was, he was like, like the guy in charge, he's like the lead pastor of the church, and, and he's leading this charge, and there's actually a time where Jesus called Peter Satan. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm trying to win people to something, if, I don't want them to know that, that Jesus called me Satan. Like, I'm going to go and be like, hey, can we edit that part out? Like, just, like, let's put that over here and let's, like, let's not do that. But look, that's not the most awkward part. I'm going to tell you, check this out in, in the Gospel of Mark. Look how awkward this is. So Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He just got arrested. And Mark 14, 51, it says, A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Why? Why is that in there? That's really, like, that's, that's kind of awkward. Like, why are we talking about folks running away naked? Are you sure this is the story of the crucifixion? Like, I've never read that. Like, yeah, this is it naked then there's this let's just take that first easter sunday okay mary goes ahead to the tomb goes to to anoint the the jesus's body um, with some oil and, and for for to finish the burial process she comes to the tomb and there's no one there so there's a few awkward things in here about this about the writing she says so she came running to Simon. so so first off it, during that time a woman you if you're writing the story you wouldn't have said a woman would come to me because no one would believe it. 
Well, it was just a woman, okay? This was a long time ago, not now. So, so, so here's the, okay, so this is John writing. So, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. The other disciple, the one Jesus loved, was John. Like, I don't know why he can't just write, she came running to Simon Peter and I. Like, she came running to Simon Peter and myself. She came running to me and Simon Peter. Like, I don't care if it's bad English. What, whatever you want to write in there. Or, or did he have a problem like writing in third person? Like, could he not write about himself and just say, hey, this is the story of how this lady come, comes running up to Simon Peter and John. And like, why has it got to be the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved? And, and to call yourself, I'm the one that Jesus loved. Like, really? It's kind of cocky. <laughs> So this is what she said to him. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, once again, not Peter and I, but Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So, like, what's John trying to say? Like, Peter's fat and slow, or he's just really fast? Like, is he trying to, like, "Ah, I'm faster than you, brother? Like, really? You didn't make the track team. (laughs) I did. Like, why is that in there? You know why it's in there? Because that's the way it happened. Because real life is awkward. Real life, we make fun of people when we outrun them. Just ask Tanner. I make fun of him all the time. Real life is awkward. And when you write it down the way it really happens... It comes out with naked people running away. It's, it's, I'm, I, it's, it's in the Bible. I'm just, you know. It was specific. It was instant. It was really awkward. But these guys were stubborn. These guys were stubborn. From the moment that Christ rose, the moment that he rose, they held to it stubbornly. They weren't backing down. They weren't giving in. They, they were, look, it was the story. And they were sticking to it because that's what happened. I, I had a conversation this week with somebody and I, and I said, I said, you know, the best way to handle this situation is tell the truth because then you don't have to make anything up. And that's what they were doing. Just seven weeks after Christ rose from the dead, that slow guy that got outran to the tomb, Peter, he stood up in front of thousands of people and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. And listen to what he said. I love this. In Acts 2, he said this. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. And I love this line. As you yourself know. So what is he doing? He's like pointing people out, I think. I, I, that's just my, my interpretation. He's like, look at Hey, y'all remember that guy? His name's Bartimaeus. Yeah, yeah, he was blind. What's up, brother? You see me? And, and look back there, Zacchaeus, he's still up in that tree because he can't see over people because he's short. And then, and then you got, La- hey, Laz, Lazarus. That's a dead man. He came out of the grave. <laughs> He's alive. Like, that's what he's doing. He's pointing out. It's like, you saw this with your own eyes. And, and then he says this, the man was hand over, handed over to you by God, deliber- God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men. So Pontius and Herod and the Sadducees and the Pharisees with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. And then the two best words you can find in Scripture, but God. Because when it says that, that means he stepped in. It says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. But God, they held to this stubbornly. And I told you this was not a fairy tale ending. This was not a happily ever after for any of them. You know, John, I told you about John. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. That was after they tried to kill him by boiling him alive. Ouch. He lived. <laughs> and then Thomas, he was a disciple. You know, he was an apostle. 
Thomas was the guy that doubted everything Jesus did his entire life. And then when Jesus died and he rose again, he still doubted. And the first time Jesus showed up to the disciples, Thomas missed church and he missed Jesus. So just think, don't miss church, okay? You might miss Jesus. I'm just saying. But, but the second time, you know, Thomas happened to be at church and Jesus shows up again and Thomas says, I won't believe unless I can stick my hand in the wounds. And, he stuck, and then he says, I believe. Well, that guy, he took a spear. Hmm. What about James? Told you he's the half-brother of Jesus. What would it take for your sibling to convince you that they're God? Enough to lose your head for it. I got a sister. It would take a lot, okay? Paul, who hated Christians before he was transformed, went by Saul of Tarsus. He lost his head too. Peter, the slow guy, they finally caught him, right? Right? And they crucified him. But when they went to crucify him, he said, I am not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord and my Savior. Will you crucify me upside down? Suffered agony because they were stubborn. I wonder what would happen if we became stubborn about it in today's world. I know what you're saying. Probably there's a lot of people that die for their faith, Right? There's a lot of people that, that, you know, they're willing to do some crazy things for their faith. Yeah, but the difference between the people now and the people, these guys, they were in a position to know whether it's a hoax or not. They saw it with their own eyes. They knew. They knew. Last thing I'll tell you this morning is the gospel... And the resurrection story will always face scrutiny. It will always face scrutiny. It's been scrutinized since the first Easter, right? Like like the the ladies show up at the tomb and and Jesus isn't there. They go back and the disciples come and he's like, he's not there. And and so what do they get accused of? Well, y'all must have stolen the body. Excuse. We didn't do anything with it. What did y'all do with it? We we don't have it. Do you have it? Scrutinized. Scrutinized. It's been scrutinized since day, from day one. And people will continue to try to scrutinize it. And there's been many theories and many thoughts as to what, what really happened because, like, this is just too good to be true, right? Like, we can't, this is just an old urban legend. It's an old wives' tale. Like, like so they, they try to poke holes in it. People try to poke holes in it. Like, he was faking it. That's the, be, that's the most popular one. Pastor Tanner talked about this last week. Like, like he's, he was just faking it. Okay, when the spear starts to come towards his side... I'm giving in. Okay, I took the whip, I took that. I'm not going to take that one. I'm good, I'm alive. Don't, no. He's just faking it? That's the best we got? Because there's too many things happening in there to just be faking it. Like like he was just just like in a deep sleep. Like, and all of a sudden, I guess those essential oils did work in that tomb, right? And so like he, he like, uh, and then all of a sudden he like comes up and he's able to take all his bandages and clothing off and and they're bloody and he folds them nicely and he walks out and he comes to the side and says, it is I, I am risen. And they go, bro, you need a doctor, like your eyeballs hanging out. And so like, like, like he was just faking it. You see, the Romans were really good at execution. They knew what they were doing. And if it wasn't proven 100% that they were dead, they'd leave them there until it could be proven. As a matter of fact, when, when Joseph of Arimathea went to, went to Pilate and said, hey, can we have the body? I got a place over here. We're going to put him in there and Passover's coming and we got to get it prepared and it's got to be done by this hour. Herod goes and looks at the Roman guards and he says, go make sure he's dead. And that's when they stuck the spear in his side. And it pierced his pericardium, and that's when the water comes out, and then it pierced his heart. That's when the blood starts to flow. He was dead as they get. Couldn't have been faking it. Other theories you're here. It was a hallucination theory. It was just everyone was just dreaming. Look, dreams are individual. Like I've never been dreaming, and like I'm like, honey, I'm in Hawaii. I'm on the beach. It's two for one. Let's go. Come on. You got to come over here and join this dream with me. Like, like, right? I wish that were the case sometimes because that, that would be really cool. But that's not the way dreams happen. It couldn't have been that. Or the wrong tomb theory. 
This is kind of rude if you ask me. Like the, the ladies come to the tomb and they come and they, they've got all these spices to anoint the body and they come up and they, they see a tomb and there's a gardener out there and they say, well, where's the body? And then he says, he is not here. And they're like, oh my gosh, he's not here. And they just get really excited and run off. And then the gardener's like, whoa, you didn't listen because they're women. And they, you know, they just jump to conclusion. They get all excited and all this other stuff. And then like, like, like he's like, I didn't finish that. He's over. The... That's a terrible theory, Right? Because then they could have just walked up and be like, they had it all wrong. Look, he's right there. They could have just pointed to it. You see, all the enemies of Jesus, you know what they do? They all assume the tomb is empty. They all say the tomb is empty. No one's denying the fact that Jesus ain't in there. I know that's bad English, but I'm the one with the mic. <laughs> Jesus was 100% dead. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. It's not a hoax. It's not a fairy tale. So why do we talk about this? Why, do I, why did I go this avenue uh, of Easter, this, this 2021? Like, why do I tell us all this? Why do I give us all this? What Josh McDowell says is evidence that demands a verdict. Because each one of us have to do something with this. And dismissing it isn't an option. There's too many facts. There's too much evidence. It would win in a court of law. Every person that you come in contact with, every person you meet has to do something with this. And if they don't do something with it now, you can come back in a couple weeks and find out what happens to them if they don't. But the real question that we have to wrestle with in this is not what Jesus did, but why Jesus did it. You see, because we can talk about what he did all day long. I can point you to historical document and historical document and this historical document and that historical document. I was in Books of Man yesterday and I go over to the history section. And I just start like looking at it and I'm like, mm, this is good and I'll read about this and I just kind of like history. But, but like, like, I can point you to things that, that line up with what the Bible says. None of those answer why he did it. Why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate? Why was he crucified? Why was he buried? Why was he dead? And why did he rise again? For you and for me. Because in those moments while he was hanging on the cross, and he cries out in Hebrew, and he says, Eloi, Eloi, laba saktani. And the people say, well, he's, he's crying out to Elijah. Let's see if he comes and let's see if he, if he helps him. And he's crying out. And what, what he was saying was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in those moments, while he's on the cross, he is bearing the weight of my sin and he is bearing the weight of your sin. And he is understanding what it feels like to have the Father turn his back on you and turn his back on me. And he is taking that punishment for you and he is taking that punishment for me. So I didn't have to and so you didn't have to. That is why he did it. Paul continued to write in 1 Corinthians 15. And he said this, and if Christ is not alive, and you and I were still lost in our sins and your faith is a fantasy, it would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have just simply perished. Just poof. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is, the limit, is limited to this life on earth, then we deserve to be pitied more than all others. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead. So I challenge you today. What are you doing with that? 
you're a believer, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, what are you doing with it? Are, are you just happy that you're going to heaven? You're going to be skipping on the streets of gold one day? If that was the only thing we lived for, the moment you gave your life to Christ, poof, you'd be gone. That's not it. So what are we doing with it? If you're not a follower of Christ, if you wouldn't say, I'm not a Christian, I don't, I'm Mickey, I don't really know. and I would tell you, you've got to do something with this. I'd love to help you in that, to, to walk with you through that. If you have questions about it, I'd love to help you take your next steps in those and just, just you know, explore what, what the Bible says. But you got to do something with it. You can't brush it off. Because one day, one day, you're going to be asked the same question that Jesus asked Peter right after he called him Satan. He says, who do you, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? So our question today is what are we doing with it? Let's pray. Father, today I thank you that we celebrate. God, I thank you that we have been given this opportunity today to worship you. God, that we've been given this opportunity today to hear your story, to hear how you died for us how you were buried and how you rose again on the third day. Father, I thank you so much for loving us so much and giving your life for us. So Father, in these moments, Father, in these moments as we sit here, I'll pose the question one more time. In an attitude of prayer, I'll pose the question what are we doing with it? What are we doing with your story? What are we doing with what you did for us? That's not a question I can answer for anyone here except myself. We each have to answer that question individually. Your mom and dad can't answer it for you. Your spouse can't answer it for you. Your brother or sister can't answer it for you. Only you can answer that. So Father, in these moments... In the stillness of your presence. God, I pray you illuminate in our hearts what we need to do. Father, we thank you for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us. We love you and we thank you in your name. Amen.